So I finally finished my flip-flop video, it took a lot longer than I thought, and that's because every time I tried to record the video, I'd get to this point and I realised I still can't explain this bit, and I'd have to go a little bit deeper, dig down a bit, and finally get the answer. And it's been like that for quite a few days now. I also want to say thanks to everyone on the course, because it's your support that lets me make these kinds of deep dive videos to satisfy my curiosity. So let's start off by looking at what's going to be covered in this video. So small text means we're not going to spend too much time and big text is what the bulk of the video is going to be spent on. To give it a bit of a contextual overview, we're going to look at combinatorial versus sequential, moving on to latches and flip-flops. And then the majority of the time we're going to be looking at how a flip-flop really works, where does setup and hold time come from, what does a setup and hold violation mean, and metastability. So really maybe the first question is, why do we need flip-flops in the first place? Why do we need sequential circuits? So when we're designing digital logic, whether it's for an FPGA or an ASIC, the part of the circuit that is doing the work, like an adder or a multiplier, that's all built out of combinatorial logic. Things like AND gates, OR gates, XORs, NOTs, these kinds of things. And we have this big pile of logic, we put the numbers in, and then a short while later, as the data propagates through that collection of cells, we get the answer out at the end. Now imagine we're implementing a filter and we want to take that output and then run it back through the multiplier a certain number of times. If we just take the output and route it back to the input, we're going to get a weird condition, a race condition, where the data is flowing round and round and round and we lose control of what's happening. So what we've got to do is we've got to catch that data as it comes out, wait and put it back in at the beginning at the correct time. And usually that's coordinated with a clock. So the types of circuits that can catch the data and hold it until a clock comes are called latches or flip-flops, and they're used for sequencing data flow. So one thing to bear in mind is this is a huge topic. In my reference book, the West A. Harris book, it's a really big chunk of the book, uh, chapter seven, all about sequencing. And this is really just focusing on a single type of flip-flop and looking at how it works. So before we can make a flip-flop, we need to make a latch. So what is a latch? Well, the simplest type of latch is just a MOSFET with the D data coming in and the Q data out going out. And this allows the data to flow through when the clock is high because it's an N-channel MOSFET. Uh, but it's got a lot of problems. It's not immune to uh, noise on the input. Uh, the, it's a dynamic circuit, so the output is only there because of capacitance on the wires. So as time goes by, this one value will degrade down to a zero. We can improve the immunity by having a transmission gate, which is a P-type and an N-type in parallel, so it allows a zero or a one through as long as the clock is set correctly. And then we can put a buffer at the end so that it can drive a bit harder, have a bit more capacitance and store that dynamic value for longer. And then we can build up to a latch like this that has a feedback circuit where the output of one inverter drives the input of a tri-state inverter and that comes back around and reinforces the circuit and we can disconnect the input with this transmission gate. So if we take a, just a quick look at this, we've got this enable here with the clock and the not clock and that basically turns on or off the output of this inverter that is on the outside. So if we've got a one coming in here, this is going to be off this is going to be on, it's going to pull it down, so the one is going to get turned into a zero, but only if these two are also set correctly. So by setting these on or off, we can make this turn on or off. That's why it's a tri-state inverter. And you'll see as we move on in the video that we're going to use a pair of latches to build a flip-flop. So now we get on to what flip-flops actually are. They're a way of sampling a bit of data as the clock comes in and then holding it steady no matter what the D input is doing and wait until the next rising clock edge. And there's a wide variety of flip-flops. So there's an interesting paper here that was recommended by a friend and we've got different types like inverting outputs with reset, with sampling on the rising or falling edge, different setup and hold times that results in different aperture sizes, power consumption and different things like this. So this paper does quite a good job of comparing a whole different type of flip-flops against each other and then choosing the most recommended one for the best immunity, the best um, immunity to race conditions, the least power consumed, these kinds of things. So what would an ideal flip-flop be like? Remember we're going to be using these to sequence data. So we, the more time we spend capturing and holding onto that data, 
the less time we've got to actually do work. So an ideal flip-flop should sample immediately, the output should immediately flow to the output, and it should take hardly any time to do the sampling. There should be no ambiguity on the output, it should either always be 0 or 1, and it should always sample exactly on the clock edge, or maybe we can move it forwards and backwards, but it's a very predictable time. So I've got a background in engineering and science communication, and my engineering background is one of the things that makes me love a practical example. And that's one reason why I think the Sky 130 open source PDK is so good, because it allows me to share this kind of information with real world examples without having to sign NDAs or ask for permission. So I'm going to use some Verilog to describe some hardware, because that's what Verilog is, hardware description language. And I'm going to say on the positive edge of a clock, sample the D and put it into Q and Q should be a register. It should remember what it is. And when I run that through open lane, I get a D-type flip-flop. And when I take my GDS and I load that up in K layout, I get this, which is a fairly complicated standard cell. It's quite a big one. Um, every time polysilicon uh, overlaps some of the P-type or N-type, that's the kind of cyan or gray there, we get a MOSFET. So we've got 26 different MOSFETs here arranged in a fairly complicated pattern, and that builds up our flip-flop. So when I want to really understand something, especially like a standard cell, I like to try and do a manual circuit extraction to pull out all those connections onto a piece of paper. And this took me quite a long time, much longer than the MUX example that I did a few videos back. Um, and you can see actually here I thought I'd done where I had an inverter followed by a transmission gate. But actually it's a tri-state inverter, which is a slightly different um, structure. So this is the final extraction, which I'm fairly sure is correct. And then I got some help from Proppy on the course to make a nice, neat schematic using ScemDraw, uh, Python library, and Maximo did this cool render. So we got the positive supply, the negative supply, and we've got the D uh, input inverter here. And then for our clock, we're taking a clock in and then generating an inverted and an an inverted inverted clock uh, so that's happening here and being distributed to the uh, transmission gates here um, and over this side we're looking at uh, the output which is a double ganged inverter so we've got a two times drive strength so how does a flip-flop flop well let's take a look at the circuit in a bit more detail I've taken this top circuit and then worked out what happens with the transmission gates when the clock is low or high and then kind of drawn out these two separate circuits. So we start off when the clock is low. The output is steady and it's isolated because you've got this one bit of data, a zero or one, reinforcing itself, this static memory being driven output to Q. And the input is kind of sampling all the time. Whatever is on D is inverted and then is charging up A. And at the moment when the clock goes high, this transmission gate opens and the one that creates the first latch inverter closes. And so whatever was on A is now going to get reinforced in this loop. The input's going to get ignored and the output is going to go straight out to Q. So we have this race condition between the data coming in and the clock. If the data is changing at the moment when we sample, we could have something that isn't exactly a zero or a one on here, and that can cause problems. So this is what leads us on to messestability. So we have our zero state at zero volts and our one state at 1.8 volts, and those are both stable. It takes work to change those values and get them to over the hill and change to the other one. But let's say that at eight, the D input was changing and it was exactly 0.9 volts at the moment the clock went high. Then we start off right at this top position, which is a meta stable place. It doesn't really want to stay there. It can move off from one side to the other, but it will stay there for a lot longer than normal. Then some fluctuation in the power supply or something like that changes and we flip into one of these other states. And another way to visualize this is with a simulation. So a friend of mine did this simulation where he took these two inverters in a feedback loop and then this is the current it takes to force it from a zero to a one state. So if we square that, we get the power. Um, and you can see we have to do this work. We have to put work in to go up the hill and then when we're balanced on the top of the hill we just stay there and then the ball can stay there for some long long amount of time long-ish amount of time until something knocks us off and then we plop back into the other state 
So depending on where we start here, if we start here, we're going to fall down fairly quickly back to one state. If we start here, we're going to fall down to the other state. But if we start up here, it takes a longer time to fall down. And if we start right in the middle, it can take a really long time. And when I say a long time, I mean picoseconds. So now to get a bit of a feel of what these lengths of times are and what the waveforms look like and to have a bit of an interactive play, I developed this tool that lets me scrub through a whole bunch of simulations. So I'm using NG Spice to run a loop as the D pulse gets moved closer and closer to the clock and then through the clock and then out of the clock and then we can turn on and off all the signals and have a look at how they interact with each other. So if you want to follow along, you can clone the repo, uh, unzip the uh, demo data set that I've included in that and then run the GUI. If you've got the PDK installed locally, you can just run the simulation and then you can also tweak the spice deck and get different results. So when you start up the program, it's gonna look like this. We can move the data pulse through into the sampling window and see how the output changes from a low to a high. And then as we keep moving, it samples low again, the output goes low. Um, we've got the schematic down here and we can turn on and off these different waves to get a better understanding. So for example, we could look at how the clock gets inverted and double inverted and we can move in here and we can use these bars to measure the time. So let's just do that quickly. We're going to measure from the 50% point to the 50% point, so that's two inverters, and that's about 70 picoseconds, so it's taken about 35 picoseconds to go through each inverter, and that's the time between the non-inverted clock and then going re-inverted and then uninverted again. Now let's zoom in on that region where the signal has to stay still and see what happens if it doesn't stay still, see what happens to the output. As that signal starts changing within the setup and hold window, the aperture of the flip-flop, the output is taking longer and longer to settle. So what we could do is turn on a couple of these other waveforms and get a bit of a closer glimpse inside. I'm going to turn off that inverted clock. And you can see how it takes so much longer to settle down than it does when we're outside a sampling window. And now maybe is a good time to say that this is one simulation from the typical, typical corner, which means it's maybe in the middle of the die where everything is working fairly correctly. But you get these different corners, these different types of simulations for lower voltage, higher voltage, faster MOSFETs, slower MOSFETs. And so if you want to know the worst case of something, you've got to make sure that you're using the right corner to simulate. And all that data gets dumped into a Liberty file. And that file is what's actually used to do the static timing analysis that we, you would use to check that your design was actually going to work and satisfy timing. You may be familiar with this timing diagram, typical for a flip-flop, where we've got the uh, clock, we're sampling, we've got to keep the data steady in the setup and hold times, and then we've got some time for the output to settle into the new value. So let's measure what these values are using the tool. And we'll start off with TCQ, the time between the clock and the Q. Let me turn off these signals. So here we've got the uh, clock, here we've got the queue, so let's make sure that's nice and stable. Put that there, and what I'm doing is I'm moving the markers to the 50% point, at 0.9 volts, and we're measuring 170 picoseconds-ish. I've got these the wrong way around. So that's TCQ. Now, how do we measure the setup time? So we do this by saying that we take TCQ and we say 5% more of that time is acceptable. So about 180 picoseconds. And then we find the point where D is to make Q, the TCQ extend that much longer. And we call that the setup time. So let's measure it. So first I'll move this to 180 picoseconds down here. And then I'll move D in until I get to that point. Zoom in a little bit maybe. About there. And then what I'll do is I'll measure this distance between these two here. 
So I'll move this one here and this one there. 50% point and I've got about 67 picoseconds. So that's our setup, about 70 picoseconds. Now let's measure the hold. And what I can do is we need to see this edge changing. Um, so I can bring back through the other side of the waveform so that the output starts going low. Do the same thing, move this to, there we go, 170 and then move it to 180 picoseconds and then find the time of the data where I'm on that 50% mark again. About there. And then again, I'm going to move this to the 50% point. And we're measuring about 20 picoseconds. But what do you notice different about this waveform that we're seeing here compared to the one that I showed you before? Here the hold is positive and it extends this way. But because the hold window is now before the clock, we call this a negative hold. And so really it would be better if I had these the other way around. So if it was after, if it was over here, I would have a positive number, but because it's behind, in front of the clock, I've got minus 20 picoseconds. So setup is the time that the signal has to be steady in front of the clock signal, and hold is the time the signal has to be steady after the clock signal. And as we've just seen with the Sky 130 flip-flop, the hold time can be negative, and that means the whole aperture is shifted in front of the clock. So we can move that aperture backwards by delaying the clock with respect to the data. And we can do that by tweaking the sizes of the MOSFETs in use while we're building the flip-flop. But this window, the aperture, stays a constant width. So as we move it backwards, we have the effect of increasing the setup time. So we have less time to do the work for the digital logic. So now let's see how setup and hold impacts us as digital designers. One of the important questions we want to know is how much time can we spend doing useful computation and how much time do we lose by having to keep the data steady during the setup and hold period? So for setup, we can say we have this worst case condition where we've got data coming out of one flip-flop through some combinatorial logic that takes some time and into a second flip-flop. And here we've got a rising clock edge, we've got TCQ, the time it takes for the data to come out of the flip-flop, the amount of time it takes the logic to do its work, and then that data has got to be steady and not move in the setup window. And this amount of time here is the slack, the time we have left over to do extra work. So we can write that out as an equation. The clock period's always got to be more than TCQ plus the logic delay plus the setup time. And an interesting thing to notice about this equation is that it involves the clock period. So say we did have a problem with the data changing uh, in the setup time. We could fix that just by increasing the clock period, by decreasing the frequency, and that would bring that changing data out of the setup time, and then our problem would go away. We wouldn't get metastability anymore. Another important question is how quickly can the data start changing after we get the clock? And that's related to the hold time. So if we take our worst case this time, we've got the data coming into a flip-flop and then immediately out into the next flip-flop, maybe, for example, in a shift register. And we want to know if we're going to get a problem with the data changing within the hold time of the second flip-flop. So we've seen this TCQ, and if this is happening within the hold window, then we're gonna get a metastability problem. So the equation here is quite simple. TCQ has always got to be bigger than hold. And it's interesting to note here that the clock period is not part of this equation. TCQ and the hold time are both parameters of a flip-flop and can't be changed later. So that's why hold time violations are so scary because we can't fix them after a tape out. And that's one reason why flip-flops have this negative hold, because it means that that equation can never be true and we'll never get hold violations. So it's true that we lose time because we remember the aperture is staying the same size, we're just shifting it forwards. So we lose time that we can be using for computation. It's as if we've got a bigger setup time. But because we really want to avoid the possibility of hold violations, we're willing to sacrifice that extra time.
So given that the Sky 130 D-type flop has a negative hold time, how is it possible that MPW1 failed with hold violations? So to give you time to think, I'm going to play this awesome render of a flip-flop doing its work done by Maximo Balestrini. Well, you probably saw my MPW1 fail vid, so you already know the answer to this question. But the answer is, it's to do with clock skew. So before, we were assuming that both flip-flops had exactly the same clock. But if we have two different clocks, then basically all our plans go out the window, and we can end up with data changing within either the setup or the hold time. And the problem with MPW1 was that the clock tree was synthesized badly, and we had so much skew across the chip that we ended up with hold violations. So to summarize, the Sky 130 flop is a transmission gate flip-flop, which according to the Berkeley paper, is a good compromise on power and race immunity. And it's got some nice uh, graphs in the rest of the paper that you can have a look at if you want to understand even deeper. So I'd like to say again, thanks to the Zero to ASIC course community, to the anonymous ASIC engineer who helped to review the slides and come up with the idea in the first place. Stefan Chippers for some input on SPICE modelling and for resources, uh, Colin O'Flynn's Metastability demo on an FPGA is pretty good. Sean Heimel's just got an FPGA series out with DigiKey and the latest one talks about Metastability. And of course, you can get loads more information and learn how to design your chips yourself on the Zero to ASIC course. So thanks for watching the video and stay tuned for the next one.